Well, welcome to Webinar Wednesday, everybody. We're so excited to have you join us with Mary Jo Beckman. She has been a mentor of mine for years and years and years and become a good friend. So I am just thrilled to sit here with you and learn and listen, as I always do. Um, Mary Jo is going to talk to us about the comparison of equine-assisted riding and driving. Um, why don't I let you introduce yourself because you're an expert in so many things. <laughs> so please toot your horn and share. You know, of course, this presentation is your intellectual property over years and years of field work and research. But, you know, you're always so generous with, you know, sharing your thoughts and ideas. So um, please, everybody know that Mary Jo is quite accessible, which <laughs> I don't know how bombarded you'll get, but we're really grateful you're here. So take it away. Thank you very much, Tara. Um, it's absolutely a pleasure to be here and welcome to everybody that's on the webinar. I uh, would like to start this off with a disclaimer and to say that um, the pictures and the videos were either taken by me or I have permission to use them or they were on the public domain. Um, but all of the verbiage that's in this slide show is my impressions um, through my experience. So. The other thing is that uh, driving is very um, varied. And so I had a limited number of vehicles and these are certainly examples that are just for the discussion. Um, I'm also going to assume for the audience that um, most people have a knowledge of the writing skill. And so therefore I'm going to emphasize more the driving for um, the comparison portion of it. So. Um, my first encounter with the um, ride versus driving was I was on the NARA instructor certification committee um, with Octavia many years ago, and then I went on to the driving committee. So that was um, that started me thinking about the comparison. So um, I would like to thank um, Horses and Human um, Research Foundation for allowing me to do this presentation this night. Um, and uh, what they do and all the research they provide certainly legitimizes our profession with um, peer reviewed and published research. Of course, something near and dear to my heart are the two veteran studies that were amazing. The other thing is that if you think that the topic tonight requires um, more study, then um, please feel free to donate money and maybe an innovative research grant of maybe $10,000 can be provided to somebody to um, do more research. So um, I grew up with horses and in high school, I was given um, Tom, who is the horse that's in the slide here. Um, I showed him in high school, uh, but kept him for 20 years which meant that I still had him when I joined the Navy. And this actually is a picture of Tom with my nephew on him. He was sitting in California. He originated in Texas. He was flown to Hawaii while I was stationed out there. I flew him back from Hawaii. He was with me in California and in Texas. So when my husband and I got married in Hawaii, we were Bob, Tom, and me. So after the Navy, I became a therapeutic riding volunteer, then an instructor, and then a driving instructor. Uh, 2006 to 2011, I had the unique and special um, uh, honor to be the instructor for the Case on Platoon Equine Assisted Programs. And you'll be seeing some of the information from that program. So um, there are eight dimensions of wellness. And um, I am going to choose to talk about five of them because I think the writing and the driving very definitely speak to these uh, dimensions and are the ones that we need to focus on. Uh, financial, I put down there as neutral because you can spend a lot of money whether you're writing or you're driving, so. Uh, the areas of the concentration I'm going to work on is the physical, which was number four on our wellness chart, cognitive, emotional, which is um, one and two on that previous chart, intellectual, competition, and then last but not least, safety that affects all of us. So for the physical and the way I've set up 
these slides is that where the two areas are equal to each other, in my opinion, then I have put that information in black. And where it starts to diverge then under the riding, then it would be in the blue and in the driving, it will be in the red. Um, so I'm gonna focus on the differences between the two. And yes, when you're sitting on top of a horse, your core strength is challenged in that you have to have trunk stability to um, remain. And that of course is riding a stride moves the body as if a person is walking in that three dimensional movements, which is absolutely amazing and is just magic. Um, the hip movements are emphasized because that's the point of contact, but the body has to be flexible without rigidity to move in unison with the horse. Well, all of that changes. And from a person that came from a riding background to go to a driving background, one is sitting there moving one's hips while one is trying to drive the horse and it doesn't work at all. The upper body strength is challenged because you have to have the posture and hold the reins and hold the whip. Um, there are also a physical abilities that um, if you're going to do things where you're gonna have some quick turns or go across bumpy ground with the cones course and the cross country, that has its own physical abilities that go with it. And in fact, some of the individuals going through those courses, particularly cross country ones will actually wear a seat belt that the person on the back of the vehicle is holding to hold the driver in place. Um, different types of movement, and I will be explaining that a little bit further. And trunk stability is, is uh, dependent on the vehicle movement. And you hold the same posture for all the gates, which is not true in the riding. We know that we go more forward as the horse goes faster. So here we have one of the Quezon um, riders, um, Ray Henniger, who went on to be um, a Paralympian, not in equestrian events, but in um, sled hockey. Uh, he is most missing both of his legs, uh, blown off during a blast, but he had amazing posture. He was always sitting upright. He was always going. And as a result, you can see that even though he has very little leg um, below his hips, he is totally in balance with the horse that he's riding. And it's that posture and it's that stability and the um, ability to move with the horses that allowed that to happen. Another rider that I had with Kason that was also a double amputee was um, Colonel Greg Gatson. Uh, for those people that went to the Williamsburg Conference uh, 2005, um, Greg was our keynote speaker, but um, he needed a little more stability. So therefore you have arm over leg um, for stability, um, but he, he also um, had great posture that allowed him to ride very well. So here we have an individual that is driving and the posture is upright. Um, and in fact, I don't see her back actually um, going to the back of the vehicle seat, um, which is the way I drive. I sit upright. Um, the motion then is that when you pull back on the reins that you then engage your um, your shoulder blades, which then you can put the pressure down in your seat and then that is stabilized by the legs being in this forward position. So um, you have to have a different amount of body mechanics that go along with the idea of having correct posture. If one sits in a vehicle um, as if they're watching TV, so they're slumped forward, they have no ability to use the back muscles, which are very important, particularly if you have a strong horse. So talking about the um, vehicle motion and input to the driver, uh, one could have a cart with two wheels versus a carriage, which has four wheels. Um, the springs will make a difference. And I have some example pictures of that coming up. And the tires can be made of different um, substances um, that allow either um, absorption of 
your um, terrain uh, or what you're driving on or not, and we'll see that. And then uh, the train itself, when you've got your arena footing, which is great for the horses, um, but can be very deep for a uh, equine trying to pull through that. Uh, some people drive on roads, which can either be paved with asphalt or gravel or dirt. Um, you can be um, in fields or in pastures, which is probably going to have quite a bumpiness that goes along with it. Um, so it just depends on how that happens, you know, what your terrain is. So this is called a, an elliptical spring. And this is on a two wheel cart. And the motion that the driver will get in the seat that's above that. So there's one on either side of the, the seat that the driver and a passenger sits in will be an up and down motion. So that's why the arrows are on either side. This is a little more challenging to see, but this is a on the antique Surrey and it is a leaf spring. So the springs are not all the way the same, all the way, they, they are stronger in the middle than they are on the sides. And in the Surrey, one gets side to side motion as it's being pulled. This is a pneumatic tire and the arrow points to what's called a spiral spring which um, is more like the springs that one would think of as being on automobiles. And so it's um, a very a strong spring. And so there's not a lot of movement that comes with it. And, but the tires being of the nature that they are, there's also some absorption that happens with the tires. So this is a rubber tire um, that happens to be on that um, two-wheeled cart. And so there's the spring, if you can see the cursor in there. And then here's the tire on the outside. And it has just a little bit of a coating of rubber. And um, so, but that is a little bit of absorption. But the best thing is it doesn't make noise when it goes on to, um, bluestone or when you're on an asphalt road, which is much different than this wheel, which happens to be on the Surrey. And it is a metal rim that goes around. And over here, you can see where it's um, bolted on. There's one and there's another one. And it is a noisemaker. It is completely um, quite challenging to try and talk above it as we go along. However, this is a Surrey that you're seeing and it has four wheels on it. It does have a top, it's not there. So it is a Surrey, but without the fringe on the top. And here's just a little short video of it. And again, that's got those um, springs that give you the side to side motion. But the most interesting thing is the Surrey was quite wonderful during COVID because um, the driver could sit in the front and passenger in the back, or we got a longer set of reins and actually had a student sitting all the way in the back and we were both wearing masks. And so it became our, our very interesting um, vehicle that we were using. Oops. Okay. Um, for cognitive um, information, um, we have to deal with sequencing of tasks and the alertness, and, and we are always in such a rich environment anytime we're around the equine. But it's different from the riding part because one is dealing with just the the awareness of the equine on the ground and then on the mounted side of it. And so that space becomes kind of small depending on the size of the equine. Um, whereas when one is driving, that awareness 
is not only on the ground, but driving a turnout. And so a turnout is where the equine is, is hitched to the vehicle. Um, but it's more along the lines, I tend to tell my students that think of driving a truck in a trailer because you've got the horse's head that's way up there, but the turns that the horse has to make affect us way back here behind the horse. And so therefore you have to have a much bigger spatial awareness when driving. Um, so focusing on a task works with the, the riding as well, but oh my goodness, one needs to focus way ahead when driving as we would as we were be driving a, an automobile to see where we're gonna go next and to see what it is that's happening. It's a much shorter field of awareness when on the horse's back than when driving. So um, for emotional, the, um, we have several that are the same with the pride and joy of accomplishing something that, that's in this amazing environment um, and with a positive interaction, uh, both with the equine as well as the instructor and the volunteers. However, one gets very much different situation because of the control of the equine comes so much, again, we talked about the physical, the, the uh, domination of the hips and using the hips and affecting our horse with one leg or the other leg or both legs and using the whole body then, which then getting positive results from the equine results in confidence and self-esteem. Well, you take the body out of it and you take your weight out of it. And so now you have the control through the hands, through the, the lines or the reins. You have your voice ever, ever so important and um, then using the whip. And actually the whip is not always used as a go forward method. It is also used as a leg aid on either side. So if a horse is bowing out, you can simply lay the whip on the side where you want the horse to come back into alignment. So it takes a lot of control to use the whip in that way, but the end result when successful is the self-esteem. Voice modulation and control is, um, ever, ever so important. One of the uh, trainings that a horse receives it's for driving is the voice commands and one needs to use them such that the equine can understand. Uh, one of the opportunities that I was given many years ago is to work with a group of teenagers that were from a psychiatric uh, rehab facility called North Spring. And I found that they did not have a voice. They did not know how to talk to the horse. And it was amazing to be able to have them get immediate consequences when they use the correct voice, when they use the correct volume, when they use the correct enunciation of the horse's name, Gable, walk on. Quite often they would go, Gable, walk on. And I said, he cannot understand that. You need to, to make sure that the horse knows that you're talking to him and then what is it you want him to do? And then he was very willing to do it. So the voice is absolutely important. So here we have one of the drivers. She happens, um, you'll hear her story in, in the next slide. But um, this was an interesting situation because Devora has an assist dog, there's Daffy. And so as part of our figuring out how, she, how Daffy was gonna get in the cart, how Devora was gonna get in the cart, we had to do some problem solving. And so the way it worked was that I got in the vehicle first Daffy got in second, and then Devorah got in third. After the drive, Devorah had, Daffy had to get out first, then Devorah, and then I got out. So it was an interesting um, arrangement that we had when uh, Devorah went driving. 
And this is a video of Devorah telling about her experience. Hi, my name is Devorah Exline. I was a corpsman attached to the Marine Corps with the Navy for a really long time, um, almost 25, 26 years. I have been fortunate enough to be driving here at Loudon Therapeutic for about a year off and on due to um, medical conditions and such. I have really noticed a huge change in a lot of things from uh, dealing with my PTSD and having those bad days, um, coming out to the farm and, and kind of having to deal with the hour and a half traffic to get here on a grumpy day is not good. <laughs> and then coming in and just, you know, getting out of the car and, and noticing Daffy is, is just smelling the air and that makes me take note. And that's like my first initial realization of, whew, I'm at the farm, also with the flies. <laughs> and right away, it just, it just gives me a calming effect, which is great. And then I get to see Andy, you know, the horse that uh, pulls the cart. And once I start grooming it, it um, it's nice. I, I just feel that symbiotic relationship with him. And it's just, it gives me an opportunity to, to chill out and not really have any expectations. Um, <laughs> See, she likes the flies too. <laughs> so that's probably the first initial thing that I've noticed coming out here. And it's just such a beautiful environment too. Um, one of the other things that's been really beneficial is I have a lot of joint issues and a lot of back problems. And when I ride, or <laughs> actually when I drive, um, I wasn't really sure how or if it would help just because of the difference of of the jostling of the carriage and I was really amazed the first time I got out of the carriage after my first initial ride here is my back my back pain went incredibly down it was amazing and even when I had the opportunity to ride last week I was in a lot of pain and I got off and I was like whoa there's no pain so there's a lot of benefits um, also my confidence in, in driving with um, initially not being able to drive independently and having the instructor with me the entire time um, made me kind of feel like I wasn't able to accomplish something. And it's really been, been beneficial to continue on and not only deal with my frustration in that and, and my anger, but it's actually helped me to calm down a little bit more and take it in stride and I've been able to drive independently. I'm not great yet, and I'm still working on it, but um, it's, it's definitely made a difference for me, and I'm, I'm hoping to continue to improve. So intellectually, um, some people rode as children, and so they're uh, renewing a new skill. Um, Probably not that many people have done driving in the past. And so it's very definitely learning a new skill, just like Devora was talking about. Um, and we have some additional education that can be provided in either one uh, of these areas as far as the parts of the horse, which would be uh, tailored into both of them. But um, in riding, we have we can go through the parts of the saddle, the parts of the bridle. In driving, we have to know the parts of the harness because if something happens, it's a safety issue to know what needs to be disconnected, when it needs to be disconnected. So it's so important to have um, that information about the harness parts. Um, We've talked uh, before about the increase in verbal skills, and um, there was a, a very interesting presentation many years ago at a Nora Slant Path International uh, Conference where a driving instructor did a whole uh, presentation about one of her students that she taught to drive because he would never drive a automobile but be, through his driving lessons of driving an equine, he then learned how to work with 
a motorized vehicle. They got him a golf cart and he was able to use that to um, uh, know when to stop at certain places to, to judge distance, um, to know when faster was maybe not better um, and different uh, things dealing with driving. So that was quite beneficial for him. Um, here's another video that I think will explain. Some more injuries are visible, others are not. Either way, recovery requires great determination. As they recover, some wounded warriors in our area have made a powerful connection with some iconic animals. Fox 5's Beth Parker has their story. You're just walking a big circle all the way around the arena. When Lieutenant Colonel Sam Narov grabs these reins, she is taking control of something else, too. I was in the deepest, darkest hellhole. Narov was injured in the early 90s in Desert Storm. She returned to combat in Iraq in 2008. Similar environment, more rockets, bombs, bullets, and bodies. Soon her post-traumatic stress disorder was so bad she had to be medevaced out. It got so bad that I couldn't even tell the difference between tents and buildings. She still jumps at the sound of a plane landing at nearby Reagan National. That almost got me. Lieutenant Colonel Narov is part of the Quezon Platoon Equine Assisted Program at Fort Myer. Through this program, I have learned that I can do anything. If I can guide a horse, I can guide my life. At a rider's side, members of the old guard, and these are the same horses that pull the case on at Arlington National Cemetery. If these horses uh, weren't out here carrying their wounded comrades on their backs, they'd be pulling the case on carrying one of their fallen comrades to their final resting place. Now this program's been in place since 2006 and so far they've had about 125 wounded warriors out riding. The one thing they all have in common I think is that they all want to be uh, contributing members of our society and uh, so it's, it's it's humbling and inspirational every Thursday for me and it's just a blessing of course to be a part of it. Larry Pence is a retired command sergeant major in the army. Okay so go ahead and walk along. He and retired Navy Commander Mary Jo Beckman started the program. Brian Eisenhower was stationed in Italy when he suffered a head injury in a car accident. Good job, Sarge. He hopes driving the wagon is preparing him to one day get his driver's license back. It helped me a lot, really it has. The program's being expanded nationwide. There was nothing to really prepare me for just the, just the magic the magic of what this really is and what it does. Narove says she's now grounded, but still moving forward. Thank you, girl. At Fort Meyer, Beth Parker, Fox 5 News. Um, I'm going to the next slide because I don't want the video to start again, but I think in that last video, we could pick out elements of that that would deal with our dimensions of the wellness that we started off with, the emotional impact of being around the equines, uh, the social interaction, uh, the intellectual ability um, that goes along with being around the equines, the physical and the environmental. Um, part of that was that both of those wounded warriors were active on a military base and they weren't getting therapy, traditional therapy in a military hospital. So, um, Quite interesting. Let's go into competition. Um, riding, uh, you know, we've got uh, able-bodied shows, um, or we've got some uh, states offer therapeutic riding shows. Some centers offer their uh, end-of-season shows. Um, those are all very positive. Uh, Paralympics have offered equestrian events since 1996, and there is a world championship that happens annually. Um, so driving can be an option for an individual that cannot physically sit astride or prefers an equine activity other than riding and there are world championships for drivers with disabilities. Um, when I was on the driving committee, I had the honor of, of uh, meeting and getting to know Mary Wolverton, who is a past NARA uh, president. And um, she and I'll Later on, I will uh, tell you that um, I went, went as one of her aides to the world championships that was in um, Scotland. So 
Um, here's the Van den Heuvel carriage, and um, it was donated originally to the Quezon platoon. Uh, just to point out the pneumatic tires, um, it is like a Royals Royce uh, as far as its driving and its springs. It is just an amazing vehicle, um, but it's pretty darn amazing in that the second seat folds down into a ramp and um, so what you're seeing is the this these are the back here to this seat and so then when it's all folded up you can't see that there's a ramp there uh, for one of the ladies that um, worked with this vehicle was Amy and so this is loading Amy into the vehicle and we always used um, a quick release um, securing devices for that vehicle in case we had a problem. And here's Amy taking the reins. Um, and this is how the reins, uh, it just as a point of discussion, just it's, it's like driver's ed, only they're not two steering wheels. There are two sets of reins or lines that happen. Um, but Amy's driving allowed her to go into the woods, um, allowed her to drive in front of mansions into the Middleburg Parade three times. Um, it was pretty crazy. But anyway, so, and uh, Amy always liked to uh, honor her, um, her horses after the drive. Uh, Amy did go into a competition, and this picture was taken from that competition, and a military veteran chose to do a picture of Amy in the vehicle, and this now is at um, the Loudon Therapeutic Riding Program in honor of Amy. So I was with um, Mary Wilverton. We went to the um, Scotland in 2004, and the the people over in Europe are so far ahead of what we do back here in the States. This is a complete chair for a lady and I have permission to take pictures of it, but she is basically sitting in a reclining seat uh, as she is driving. And she drove every course and did everything that all the other drivers do. She just did not have sitting posture and could not um, sit upright. And so therefore she sat in this seat and she was lifted up and put into the seat. So we really need to talk about safety. Um, we know that if an Equine spooks, we can do an emergency dismount and we can separate the rider from the equine and those two are apart. Driving is much more challenging because first of all, the driver cannot separate from the vehicle. Um, otherwise one has a horse that is completely in flight mode and um, has to, it has this thing that's rumbling behind it and can't get away from it. And so therefore we are always taught that the driver stays with the vehicle. Um, there is um, an emphasis totally on quick release connections to try and abide by any safety issues if we get caught in a situation. And we do have to prepare that even though we have the most amazing equines around that um, there could be a runaway. And I will tell you that I was driving with Amy and we had a horse run away with us and she was as cool as a cucumber and she went driving after that. But it is um, something that one needs to prepare for uh, and hope it never happens just like all the other emergency drills that we do with the equines. So, um, I thought we'd have a little fun towards the end here and that um, we could see some riding since we have um, the coronation coming up. And so we were at the Queen's 90th birthday.
And so one could see, we were talking about the posture, we were talking about the movement of the horse, we were talking about um, all those physical aspects that have to take place as um, one is um, riding a horse. And certainly those are very, very capable and very amazing riders um, who do a lot of formations. Um, as part of the Royal Windsor Horse Show, um, there was a, a carriage competition. And so we were able to see the carriages drive off and I thought that this would be um, something of interest. And that is a lot of horsepower that is very controlled um, going off. And um, one thinks of dressage as being poetry in motion. Uh, this was the winner of the four in hand competition uh, at the Royal Windsor Horse Show. And I thought you would enjoy seeing a cones course. This is all able bodied, of course. I just am always in amazement every time I see that video, um, how it's so graceful and how he makes it look so easy. And my final slide is that um, when can combine the riding with um, a vehicle. And so here you have the queen's, um, one of her royal coaches, and it is pulled by riders that are riding. Um, and so um, this was in celebration of the Queen's 90th that they had all of this, um, the vehicles that were being put into this big arena. The other thing is the case on video that you saw earlier that also was um, the horses are ridden on the left hand side. Um, and so that vehicle is pulled as well. So. And um, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Mary Jo, so fascinating. I always learn so much from you and each time it's a different thing, you know, over and over. So this is amazing. I have a ton of questions. We'd love for any of the participants to chime in on the chat. Um, Deborah's in the back scenes. She's sending any questions our way. So please chime in on the chat. Um, we'd be happy to take those. But some things that, you know, that jumped out at me personally, Mary Jo, was especially like the um, the tires. So very similar experience. I work with military and um, the uh, metal tires versus the rubber tires. We've had, you know, um, both on different carriages and metal tires. You are absolutely right. Really important if you're working with veterans or military. They've straight out say it reminds me of the tanks churning on the gravel or the road or any of that. So a lot of the things you pulled up, I mean, it's really important to know the trauma-informed care that you're even doing with which population and why those selections. Do you have any other thoughts about, you know, um, experiences with that? Why you would select? Well, the, the selection of the vehicle uh, depends a lot on what equine is going to be pulling that vehicle because there it has to be proportional, it has to be sized. Mm -hmm. um, so therefore we do have one horse that can pull that two wheeled cart as well as the Surrey. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting, one day I was taking an individual for a ride. Uh, it was not a lesson per se, but I was asked would I take him for a ride in the Surrey? And he is an individual that has early Alzheimer's mm. and he was very uncomfortable in the vehicle. And because we had the second seat back there, I asked if we could get a helmet on his wife and his wife could be in the second seat. And it was a changed person when the wife was there with him. And um, that vehicle just allowed 
that experience to happen to become more positive for the individual with early Alzheimer's. It's amazing knowing that flexibility of, you know, what your horse can handle, what your carriage is, you know, and what the person needed, you know, specifically looking at client-centered, even though horse-based. So we do have a few questions. Let's jump in here. Joelle says, Mary Jo, how do your fees compare riding to driving lessons? Good question. Uh, They're the same. Um, I get paid the same. um, And I think the participants um, get charged the same. Okay. Thank you. And then uh, Don. Um, so actually, you know what, with maybe Joelle, um, reply back to that, because are you thinking that, you know, um, carriages and the harnesses and everything else costs significantly more than a saddle? Is that what you're asking? So let's see if you're talking about, you know, um, equity in um, equipment. So Don um, says, hi, what criteria do you have or use to permit a student to drive independently? Great question. Um, I can tell you that that sometimes happens on a day-to-day basis, Mm. depending on how the uh, student driver is working with the equine and the voice, responsiveness to the voice, the control. Um, Amy was the only one that was driving off of the bit. Everybody else is driving off of cheek pieces. Uh, just because they don't have the hands that can um, work off the bits to save the horse's um, mouths. Um, Are we driving inside? Are we driving outside? Is it raining? Um, There are lots of different variables. And I think the same things come into play when one is working with a rider and when you all of a sudden let them loose of the leader. Great point. Yeah, that's that's why there's training and, you know, a, a team to make those kind of decisions together. Good point. One of the things that, you know, really stood out me, um, for me with the um, video with Devorah was even she said, you know, some, sometimes I'm having dark days and grumpy days and then I get to the farm. Um, we know that environmental, you know, cue definitely. And, and to see her in the video laughing and, you know, joking about flies, which could be huge cues. Um, you know, we know a lot of black flies were in the deserts during the wars. So, I mean, just to see her joking and comfortable and, you know, just light up about the opportunity she's had, had to drive. Um, can you tell any other stories of some clients that, you know, were special or jumped out at you? Um, well, the one that was featured, Amy, um, she will never drive a vehicle, but, Mm -hmm. She has um, no problem telling her friends that she can drive a horse (laughs) and that makes her very special. And when we were driving in the Middleburg parade, because she had been participating in a program in Middleburg for individuals with disabilities, the people in the crowd recognized Amy as the driver and started chanting, Amy, Amy, Amy. And it was amazing. That's incredible. That is, right? I mean, that's, you know, those once in a lifetime experiences to be able to sit and, you know, be a part of that journey, literally. So we do have another response from Jolie. Um, Joelle, I hope I'm saying your name right. Um, She says, is it a private lesson? That's an expensive hour for the program versus group riding lessons. So that's a good point. Is the driving a... um, private, or is there an able-bodied whip in the vehicle for independence as well? So two questions. Uh, So I have only had one able-bodied whip be in the vehicle, and that's when I was injured and I could not be into it. And what I found was that I had to give instructions for driving and then I could not speak to them while they were out driving because they were so far away from me and I was mobility impaired. So I would have them go off and do something and they would come back and then I would critique it and then send them off again. And so, but the majority of the time I'm in the vehicle uh, as the able-bodied whip and as the instructor. And yes, most of the time they're single lessons, but when I worked with the North Spring group 
they would have um, um, as many as three individuals come out. And so they would all participate in horse grooming, horse harnessing, putting two, but then they would drive one at a time. And then they would all participate with um, the unhitch, unharness and putting the horse away. So we were able to do some groom, some group things, um, but the driving was independently. But I had a wonderful volunteer that was a former school teacher. And so we came up with worksheets. And so for the two that were not driving, they would go over the harness parts or they would go over different horse facts. And she would have a clipboard for them with worksheets. That's a great way to keep people busy and, and interacting and still learning. I love that. That's a great idea. One of the other things that, you know, um, really spoke to me and, and I think many people about driving is the finding of the voice. Um, you know, we do a lot of ground driving actually. So, you know, 2000 pounds and, you know, harnessed up and, and driving from the ground. And, and again, that same idea of finding your voice, right. It's just kind of the, okay, Merlin, walk on, come on, Merlin, you know, <laughs> those types of things. And, and when all of a sudden you're like, come on, say it like you mean it, you know, and then someone actually, okay, Merlin, walk on, you know, and, and it really is. And, and when they get that reaction, it's incredible. Um, we find that with uh, specifically survivors of sexual trauma, um, children of domestic violence. You know, can you speak a little bit about, you know, how you teach that, how you teach Find Your Voice? Um, it, it just, the equine lets them know when they're doing it correctly. Huh. And so they get immediate feedback just like a rider would, um, but it's very important that they give the horse time to respond because you're talking through the rear end and the whole length of the, the horse uh, before it reaches their ears. Now we can all see that the horse is thinking it wants to go. And so the other thing is by finding the voice, they have to say it maybe two times but they need to give the horse processing time. So it's a, not only finding that voice, but pairing up with the equine to allow it to do what's being requested. And so that's always an interesting one because there's a tendency to go, Gable, walk on, Gable, walk on, walk, you know, and, and, so they've completely lost it. The horse has absolutely no idea what's being wanted or desired because they're not speaking clearly and telling them. The other thing is that, and you may have this with your ground driving, is that they think the horse can't hear you. Mm. And so they talk very loudly to the horse. And I'm trying to say, no, you have to modulate back. The other thing is when they're trying to say that they want the horse to um, whoa, and they're going, Gable, whoa. And of course, <laughs> he's, he's thinking, I'm out of here. <laughs> and so that's where one has to kind of look back and say, how are you talking to this equine? And is it in a way that um, he or she is able to interpret that information the correct way? The other thing is that if a horse is going too fast, instead of just pulling back on the reins, quite often um, a horse can be slow and talking to them, just like we would do if we were riding them. But of course, we need to do that real time and then reward them when things are going well. And that's the emotional piece, would you say that emotional regulation, you know, kind of understanding that, you know, um, that that relationship, that that trust that's built. Um, and it's interesting, you know, there's they're just not hooked up and then hop in. Right. They're part of the the grooming and the harnessing and all of that. OK, so that's a significant amount of time. Um, but so the lesson what if you're doing 15 minutes on, you know, the back end and the front end and that's 30 minutes, would you say, of, of actual drive time? Uh, anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes of driving. Got it. Okay. It's, it's an hour long lesson and, um, we can actually accomplish quite a bit, but we're also going to do a warm up with the horse yeah. and we're going to do a skill and we're going to do a cool down. And so, um, we do all the different uh, lesson components that go along with it. 
So that's amazing, right? So they're realizing that there is warm up in life, right? There's, you know, why we, you know, take our time, you know, looking at our hygiene or looking at, you know, all of those different things as well as the cool down. And I, I, we do the same with our, our lessons is that, you know, that hour is all part of the relationship. And you're able to see if, you know, the client has the wiggles or is having a bad drive here, or if the horse maybe had, you know, you know, a grumpy night. Right. So I think that's really important in the relationship. That's awesome that you guys built that into. And I hope others do. I would imagine they do. You know, I see, you know, Kristen Marcus from Chaps there, who's a total pro. And and I know she does build that in in her programming as well. So we only have a few minutes left. I'm sure I'm a pro. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So we only have a few minutes left. Anybody else have a last comment or question? You know, we want to respect your time and not go over. Um, I think we've hit all the, the comments and the questions. Let's see, get my, my glasses back on. Yeah, looks pretty good. Anybody else have anything they want to ask Mary Jo? Well, I'm so grateful. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing your talent, um, your experiences. I think it was a really clear way of understanding the benefits of both and then what you're looking for and identifying what's best for the client's needs. It's amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. It's always a pleasure to share information. Thank and you all for putting this on. <laughs> Well, we're so grateful that you all joined us. We have another great one coming up next Wednesday or next month on web webinar Wednesday. You know, of course, any of the support that you could send our way always helps. Even small donations gets us closer to those new innovation grants. Um, many thanks to our amazing executive director, Pebbles. Um, please check out the flyer, the email, e-news. Um, so great information, lots coming up, especially some um, information about opportunities and conferences and um, abstracts and grants. So we're always doing things here. Let us know if you're ever interested in joining us and being a part of the team. Um, there's lots of committees available um, that would hopefully meet your needs. So again, thank you everybody. And thank you so much for joining us. Um, Mary Jo, amazing presentation. Thank you.